Warning, the following program contains extreme sports and violence and may not be appropriate for younger viewers. Viewer discretion advised. Rousey versus McMahon, February. That's the headliner. And that's a fast turnaround. She goes right back into camp. I'm ready to get back into it. I'm still hungry and this is what I love to do. I feel like I could fight again tonight. Olympic medal is undefeated for the championship. We've never had that many factors come together. Women's MMA has almost skipped ahead of the guys. Before we ever even knew each other, we were striving for the same goal in our individual sports. It raises the whole level for everybody. I've competed against Olympic medalists. I've competed against world medalists and champions. I couldn't be more excited to have an athlete of Sarah's level to really test myself against them. This is the perfect time for everything to be coming together. Women's bantamweight champ Ronda Rousey defends her title against Olympic silver medalist Sarah McMahon. Strike Force heavyweight Grand Prix champion Daniel Cormier will face undefeated UFC newcomer Patrick Collins. And MMA phenom Lori McDonald will face Brazilian Jiu Jitsu standout Damian Maia. This is Countdown to UFC 170. Bring the champ out here. I'm going to make it official, the first ever UFC women's champion, Ronda Rousey. She'll be fighting Liz Carmouche, and she is the main event. This is a gigantic cultural moment, Mike, and this is not just a moment for Ronda Rousey. This is a, a moment for women's sport, period. This is going to open the door to so many young women that never thought about doing this as a career. Fighting is universal. It transcends. February 23rd, 2013, and the first woman to enter the octagon. It may be the only arena in sport where men and women are looked at as almost equal. If there's anything that the UFC has shown, that these are main event competitors. There was a lot to prove that fight. It, it was a big experiment to take the women on. That card not performing wasn't an option. I couldn't have it be a failure. That card had to do well. She might be the biggest star in the UFC now with George St. Pierre retiring. She might be the biggest star in the UFC. She's got a magnetism about her that a lot of people don't have. Ronda Rousey has put women's MMA on her back. But competing at the highest level is nothing new to Ronda Rousey. Before becoming the face of women's MMA, she won a bronze medal in judo at the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing. It was directly after that time that Rousey desired a life many 21-year-olds take for granted. Right after the 2008 Olympics. I wanted to be normal for a little bit. I wanted to have my own apartment, my own car, my own dog, and I wanted to work as a bartender. And I got all those things. And uh, it was much more difficult than I thought it would be. We had a, a tiny, tiny apartment. We had as much free room as my kitchen <laughs> now. And uh, it, was, it was hard, for sure. Throughout all this, my whole life since judo, my dog has been the one consistency, I think, in my life. I'm really lucky that I've been able to afford a lifestyle where I can actually just be on the beach. And I can just walk out and go look at the ocean and sit there with my dog. 
that actually makes me a lot happier than a lot of other things could. We didn't see Ronda for the rest of 2013 because she filmed The Ultimate Fighter. Ronda was coaching on the show against Misha Tate. She can't stand Misha Tate, her arch rival, who she already fought once in Strike Force and beat. We got 12 weeks of these two bickering back and forth on television. It was pretty entertaining at times. away from my boyfriend? I'm really not sitting near your boyfriend. I don't think anyone with half a brain would desire a man like that. People start to see a different side of Ronda Rousey. He's smiling at my girl's pain today. There's one more reason I'm gonna destroy you again. I like being the heel and Joker. I always thought it was way more interesting than Batman. She goes from Miss America Wonder Woman, the hero of women's MMA, to a villain and completely okay in that situation. Your people absolutely love me and they can stand me, but at least they had a very passionate opinion about me. judo career I was always the bad guy and I just always loved shutting crowds up I never worked for cheers I worked for silence if you doubt me and you don't want me to win that motivates me more than anything She's getting taken down by Ronda. She's gonna work on I've never heard of before. I call them anti-fans. I'm here to entertain, I'm not here to be liked. coach and he said call him back and tell him what when he bitch he wants in February so I called him back and told him back to that <laughs> Dana what did you just hang up that's my last question Rousey versus McMahon February that's the headliner and that's a fast turnaround she goes right back into camp I'm in the best shape of my life now so I think it'd uh, be perfect time to just go back to back I'm ready to get back into it I'm still hungry and that's what I love to do. Hopefully I'll have another good show for you guys very soon. It's going to be Ronda Rousey versus Sarah McMahon to headline UFC 170. For the first time ever, we're getting two Olympic medalists, both undefeated, meeting inside the octagon. Except where Ronda was a judo practitioner, Sarah was a wrestler. Right away, that's uh, an intriguing matchup. She's in her groove, she's in momentum. We took a few days off and we get back to training. We know exactly what to do with her so she'll be in the best shape of her life. They contacted me, it was about five weeks before that fight and I just knew that I was fighting the winner of that fight. McMahon got a much more of a heads up than I did about this fight. But it doesn't really matter to me. She could have known five years ago. I'm still gonna beat her. Ronda Rousey's judo, it might be Sarah McMahon's wrestling. 
Sarah McMahon, a little bit of an unknown, just one fight in the UFC, but a former Olympic wrestling silver medalist. We should take probably her strongest strength with her wrestling. It pales in comparison to Sarah McMahon. There's no way that Ronda Rousey goes in there and throws Sarah McMahon around like she has everybody else. around wrestling my brother wrestled since I was three years old when he started you know I, I just grew up in the wrestling culture when I was 14 years old I was the only girl in the state at that time that was competing so it's always me and the guys <laughs> but in 1999 Sarah's older brother Jason the person most responsible for her passion for wrestling was tragically taken from her when he was just 21 years old. I was 18 years old and my brother was murdered. It was my freshman year of college. When they locked him up, I was happy that he didn't have the capability to do that to anybody else's family, but nothing that happened to him was ever gonna bring back my brother, nothing. I was really, really angry to have somebody who I love so much that I idolized taken away from me in that way. I was working myself to where I couldn't think about anything else. I just filled my schedule up with wrestling. The busier I could be, the less I had to deal with those crushing emotions. bad day is now. I know what having things go disastrously wrong can be. I can truly leave everything out there and I can risk take and I can push the pace as hard as I possibly can. Lifelong athlete like Sarah McMahon, competitive drive can come from a multitude of different places. But losing in her sport on the world's grandest stage proved to be the biggest turning point. In Athens in 2004, uh, at the Olympics, I got the silver medal and not winning the gold, I was just absolutely devastated. Like I wanted it that bad and I was just, it was so frustrating to me. I started in MMA after I had my daughter. While I was pregnant, I realized that I'm just not done competing. That part of my life, it just hasn't run its course, and I know I want it. I didn't expect the UFC would add a women's division. I wanted to just be the best in the world, whatever promotion decided to pick up the women's 135 pound division. in the third ever women's UFC fight. I kind of expected that I was going to feel nerves and things were going to be a lot more difficult. And Sheila Gap, a very accomplished striker, very intimidating presence in the cage. Are you ready? Are you ready? Fight! And then I got there and I had a lot of fun. Sarah McMahon in her UFC debut. It took her all of five seconds to go out there shoot on Sheila Gaff and put her on her butt. Sarah McMahon pretty much just imposes her will. This is just what Sarah McMahon wanted. Now Sarah's on top of her. Sarah McMahon is able to utilize her wrestling, get in top position and absolutely control Sheila Gaff. Sarah McMahon inside control, mounted crucifix now. It was one of the most fun fighting experiences that I'd ever had. She's not going to get out of this, folks. But you got a silver medalist on top of you like this. This is where you stay. Great position for McMahon. 
Big power with the ground and power. Oh! Looking to finish it right Are you here. Kidding me. And it is all over. Finishes her pretty impressively right away. And uh, you kind of knew that Sarah McMahon was coming for a title, and this was going to be someone to look out for in the UFC. for about a year and a half. Ronda's always been her goal. Even though Sarah had another opponent who would work on those skills for that opponent, but then always go back to Ronda. Everyone's been prepping for me since the beginning of 2012. I have the belt. I don't know if anyone can deal with Ronda Rousey's armbar. It's like that fatality in Mortal Kombat. To offensively pull it off, you have to do every step of the way right. But I only have to shut it down at one point in that process. You could know every single defense. I've seen all of them before you have. That's something that you can't learn in a year and a half. Sarah McMahon has the ability to stop some of Rousey's heralded judo throws. It's not going to get taken down that easily for her. Beautiful takedown by Ronda. Looking for a takedown. Takedown. Ronda gets it down again. That is Olympic caliber of judo. Misha made a lot of mistakes. She was diving into Ronda's clinch a lot. That was giving Ronda the ability to throw Misha. I've been doing freestyle since I was 16 years old. The high amplitude throws are what people are going for. Ronda fighting on a short break is going to benefit us. She needs to bring nothing but her A-game or she will lose. In every fight, people say that this person's going to be the one. They're going to hope and pray and cheer. I'm just going to keep supporting them. Talking UFC 170. Sitting next to me, DC Daniel Cormier. Daniel, how you doing, my man? Doing pretty good, man. Just to be fighting on the same card as two girls that I, I went to the Olympic Games with, uh, Ronda and I twice. Yeah, it's a big deal. You can say why I wrestled in the NCAA championship. Well, you didn't wrestle in the Olympics. Not many people got to do that. Obviously, a lot has been made of your weight cut. You're changing weight classes, right? Yes, I am. I've been fighting a heavyweight. Now I'm going to fight at a weight that's more natural for my body. Daniel Cormier, you're fighting uh, Sugar Rashad Evans. Yep. Ten days before this fight, Rashad Evans pops his knee. Rashad Evans is injured and has to pull out of UFC 170. I hear about this kid, Patrick Cummins, who was claiming that when he would train with Cormier, he would make Cormier cry. This guy's working in a coffee shop. And I said, you can tell your manager you're all set. You're fighting the UFC now. Is there truth to you making him cry? Yeah, absolutely. You've completely put yourself in my crosshairs, and you're going to suffer for your words. It's probably the biggest mistake Pat Cummins has ever made in his entire life. Life is about opportunities. This guy got an opportunity. He jumped on it. This is my dream. This is the fast track. There's nothing better. What's going to happen? We never know what's going to happen. MMA is crazy. Anything can happen. Come out and watch the fights. I promise you we're going to put on a good show. And, and who doesn't want to go to Vegas? While Patrick Cummins jumped at his first opportunity to fight on the big stage, not every unseasoned fighter would have the confidence to do so. Two years into Daniel Cormier's MMA career, his management approached him about entering the strike force of the Grand Prix, and he had a different approach entirely. They started talking about the tournament. Fatal, Bigfoot, Overeem, Verdun, Josh Barnett. I just had my fingers crossed. I was like, please don't try to put me in the tournament. They were like, well, you're going to be an alternate. And I was like, I don't even know if I want to be an alternate. I mean, big old hulking guys. I mean, I'm 5'10", you know. And uh, they called me five weeks notice to fight Bigfoot Silva in Cincinnati. I was like, you got to be Please welcome to the cage the U.S. Olympian, Daniel Cormier. When I fought Bigfoot Silva, bro, I hadn't even been fight two years. It was short of my two-year anniversary in MMA when I stand across the cage against Bigfoot. Who had just beat Fatal? What have I gotten myself into this time? Look how big Silva's hands are compared to Cormier's, my goodness. I 
was nervous. And then when we started fighting, I was like, man, this is, this is I mean, I belong at this level. <laughs> like Bigfoot Silva is a guy that you just don't walk in and beat in the first round, especially in the way that Cormier did. Heavyweight World Grand Prix here in San Jose. Daniel Cormier, Josh Barnett for all the marbles. Boy, no feeling up close. These guys are going right at it. Barnett beginning to go in for that kill. Daniel Cormier threw him around like he was a rag doll. Heavyweight World Grand Prix Tournament Champion, Daniel Cormier! After I won that tournament, man, it just seemed like everything kind of just changed. And then ever since, it's kind of been no turning back. You can't go backwards after you fight Josh Barnett and Big Fusso. Daniel Cormier comes into the UFC and uh, everyone wants to know uh, right away how it's going to play out, who he's going to face. Cormier made his debut against Frank Mir, uh, former UFC heavyweight champion, long time veteran, one of the real great of the sport. The UFC respects what I have done in fight force and carries water. You don't get those types of fights. You don't get to stand across the cage from Frank Mir, a guy that was a two time champion, most wins in heavyweight history. You have to earn those fights. Frank he says he's never been in better shape. He says he's never been more focused for another run of the title than he is right now. Good. Here we go. Good punches by Daniel. Good combination by Cormier. So explosive. And the pace and pressure he keeps right here is what has made him successful. Daniel Cormier pretty much has his way with uh, Frank Mir. Outboxes him. Really just beat him in every area. And he did the same thing with Roy Nelson. Swing and a miss. <laughs> and he can do that basically to anybody who wants. Nice knee to the body. The big right hand. In my opinion, Daniel Cormier is the number two heavyweight in the world right now, and he's giving that up to move down to 205 pounds. Here's the thing about Daniel Cormier, he's always been an undersized heavyweight. Daniel Cormier was a light heavyweight in the heavyweight's body, fighting guys who were much bigger than him. Daniel Cormier is dropping down to 205, as he often said he would, a lot because of who holds the belt at heavyweight. Daniel Cormier trains alongside UFC heavyweight champion Cain Velasquez. Those two have built a very special bond in their time together. And as it becomes more evident that Cain Velasquez is going to be sitting atop that throne, it was important for the decision to be made. My chance to be the champion is at 205. I don't want to fight Cain. Him being hurt right now is tough on me because I don't have my main partner, but he comes here to give more support. He's a great friend and great asset. A lot of my success is directly because of him because every day, if I didn't get better, he would just mow right through me. Most days, I'd have to crawl out of the cage of the ring. Because of that, he helped me. And uh, now, my skills match where I am mentally, physically. It's time to actually take on that part of him today, and I'm ready for it. After showing tremendous potential at heavyweight in the UFC, Daniel Cormier decided to make the cut to 205 pounds, a weight division where he felt he had the best chance to be champion. Cormier was originally scheduled to fight number three contender Rashad Evans, and with a win, he could fast track his way to a title shot. This is a huge fight for Daniel Cormier. This is the first fight Daniel Cormier is dropping down to 205 pounds. The cut has gone unbelievable. His training is unbelievable. He feels great. He's in the best shape he's ever been in. Ten days before this fight, Rashad Evans is training. Rashad's foot gets caught in the mat, twists his foot just the right way, and pops his knee. I was very concerned that I was going to do all this work, diet, all the hard training for nothing. He was calling me all night saying, get me a fight, get me a fight, get me a fight. I said, listen, Daniel, nobody's going to fight you on 10 days notice. I wake up the next day, and apparently this Twitter battle had been going on with Cormier and Patrick Cummings. Patrick Cummings. Pat. He was one of my 
training partners when I was getting ready for the Olympic Games in 2004. So this kid was a two-time NCAA All-American. Impressive, but what's even more impressive is he was a walk-on. And he claims that when he would wrestle with Cormier, he would make Cormier cry. They put us together in simulation matches. I threw him for five. And which, if you don't know, throwing for five is, you know, basically he's throwing his hips over his head. So <laughs> I hear this in my ear. I'm like, what's going on, man? What's going on right now? And then, you know, I, then we kind of, we, we break and we come back and I see his face crying. You know, I'm like, this dude's crying right now. What the hell? <laughs> I'm intrigued. So I call his manager. His manager says he's working right now. You can't get a hold of him. I'll call you back in a few minutes. I got a job at a coffee shop down the street. Around 8 o'clock, 8.30, I get, I get a couple of calls. You know, I feel my phone vibrating in my pocket. I'm like, man. He was working. They wouldn't put him on the phone. He wouldn't answer his phone. He was busy with customers. So I drove down there and hopped out, went in the front, front of the coffee shop. And he's at the back window, and his managers wouldn't get him. So I walked around outside to the window where he's with a customer. I said, hey, you got to get on the phone right now. You need to tell me right now, do you want this fight? I kind of look at my boss, and I'm like, I got to I gotta do this, you know? And she's like, OK, well, this is the end of the job, <laughs> you know? So he gets on the phone. He basically says, am I going to get this fight? Because I just got fired. And I said, you can tell your manager you're all set, OK? You're, you're done. You're, you're fighting in the UFC now. At the end of the day, this is my dream. I've been devoting my life to this. With this one goal in mind, to be, to be the best 205er in the world. And this is the fast track, and there's nothing better. If you know what you're looking for, you can tell by the way a guy walks in the gym if he's gonna be good. Right away, I knew he was special. He has passed every single test that has been put in front of him. All your hard work actually paid off to this point now. You stay disciplined and diligent and dedicated to what you want to do. This kid Cummings comes out of the camp. You know, he trains with Munoz, he trains with Chael Sonnen. This guy's trained with all the best in the world. I do believe he can be a champion at 205. He's developed a style that's unbelievable. I've wrestled both of these guys. I'm confident in his ability. I'm confident in his style. And he's definitely gives Daniel a run for his money. When I trained with Pat, we did a little bit of everything. We wrestled, we boxed, we did MMA, but we would also do a lot of gymnastics. He's very coordinated. He's very agile, particularly for a guy his size. People his size just don't do gymnastics. He's a very special athlete. He's also got a great gas tank. And his day off, his recovery day is a four hour mountain bike ride. His favorite part of mountain biking is the climb, not the descent. Obviously, a, you know, a very gifted athlete. He's undefeated in, in mixed martial arts. He's 4-0, and every one of his four fights were finishes. He's there to break people, to push people so far out of their comfort zone that they don't want to be in there anymore. Yes, Cummins locks out moisture, seals in freshness, and gets the tap. Another first-round finish. Beautiful work. A lot of power in that show more fights that he won, the less people were willing to fight him. And ultimately, we just started to go through prospect lists, and everyone would turn him down. We had over 50 opponents turn him down. He's gone and reported, and guys like, oh, no, I'm not fighting him. I mean, it's, it's got, it was that bad. He's got a gym reputation. He's trained at ATT and Black Zillions, and he's respected in the gym. And I think that his reputation precedes him. They look at the fight, and they're like, well, I don't think this is a smart fight for me, because I'm not making any money, and to fight this caliber of guy, you know, it should be in a bigger arena. So, 
it's, it's tough, but I need, I need the fights. <laughs> he had the same problem that Cain Velasquez had. He had to go to the UFC because the, the minor leagues, if you will, just didn't have anybody that would compete with him. He just needed a chance, and this is his, this is his chance right here. There's many things I love about this sport, but one of the biggest things I love is opportunity. Patrick Cummins woke up this morning and went to his job at a coffee shop. He is going to end his day live on Fox Sports 1 and doing media around the world. And next Saturday night, he will fight on the biggest stage in the world. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of UFC Fighting Words. Patrick Cummins, everybody, welcome. We've seen fights before that we thought were Rocky stories. This is the real Rocky story. I hear about this kid who claims that when he would train with Cormier, he would make Cormier cry and broke him every time they wrestled. Is there truth to you making him cry? Yeah, absolutely. Things that happen in that wrestling room stay in the wrestling room. So not only have you crossed the line, you've completely put yourself in my crosshairs, and you're not Pat Cummins, a nice kid anymore. You're a guy that I got to go into that octagon, and you're going to suffer for your words. Mm -hmm. You do truly believe you're going to beat him. I know all Daniel's weaknesses. I know, I know that I can push him, and he will break. Plain and simple. That and then, then you compound, ridiculous. oh, man, I got to lose a bunch of weight, come down 205 for the first time. That's a lot going against you, man. You just don't prod a guy that has advantages over you already. Now you're the enemy. I got to beat you. I got to smash you, Pat Cummins. He's going to sit back in that chair at the end of the round and be like, oh, no, what have I done? Are you worried about the fact that you're taking this fight on such short notice? The biggest thing I'm worried about is what percentage of Daniel's purse I'm going to get when he doesn't make weight. Let's say like 20, 30 percent. Let's go for 30. Pat, if you got 30 percent of my fight first, that would be more money than you've ever made in your entire life. I expect to dominate the fight as I do every time I step into the cage. Show Pat Cummins from the moment the referee says fight that, man, I'm in over my head. I'm going to be in his face from the start, push the pace, and look for a finish the entire time. It'll come just from being relentless, dragging him to a place that he's never been. His biggest mistake Pat Cummins has ever made in his entire life. Because not only did he take a fight with me on 10 days notice, he actually prodded me. I want to beat him in every facet of every part of mixed martial arts. I don't want him to feel like he won anything. On Sunday, when he gets up in the morning, he wakes up and goes, man, that dude beat me at every turn. St. Pierre. They were teammates. People constantly asked Rory, constantly asked George, will you two fight each other? They said no. Certainly you hate to see a champion as great as George St. Pierre walk away from the sport, but it really does add some life back into the 170-pound division. Rory McDonald can assume that throne if he wants to. He's going to have to beat Danny and Maya and win a couple more fights before he gets to that point, but the future is wide open for him to become champion. Now that George is not the champion, it definitely takes off pressure for me. I'm focused on winning my next fights and, and getting that belt. That's all I really see in my near future. Keep the hands up, Rory. I'm tired. I'm tired. Keep them up. Rory McDonald is part of that new generation of mixed martial artists that we say we all can't wait to see. Guys have been training in every single art since they were little kids. Speak that jack to the back, Rory. Speak that jack back, Rory. There you go, Rory. Rather than being someone who specialized in jiu-jitsu, specialized in wrestling, and specialized in boxing, Rory started training everything at the same time. He's one of the very first guys that we've seen that started out in mixed martial arts and has got a lot of hype behind him. And uh, really was looked at as a future champion from the moment he stepped in the octagon. I was 14, I found the gym that I started doing MMA training at. From there, it just took off. I quit all my other sports and really focused my life on mixed martial arts. Money or no money, I knew that that's what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. 
fell in love with it and um, I started getting really good and I started fighting professionally and it just had a life of its own from there. I'll never forget watching Roy McDonald throw Nate Diaz around the cage at UFC 129 because nobody had ever done that to Nate Diaz. BJ Penn, it was seen as a big test for him, a guy who, who was a veteran, who knew all the tricks, and you know, was Roy McDonald ready to compete at the top level. myself included, thought he was going to handle easily. Robbie Lawler. And this is a big fight. It would be a huge, huge statement. This is a contrast in styles. The differences between these two guys is that Robbie relies more on instincts and explosion. Head kick by Lawler. Yeah. That he might big hit punch by Lawler. Lawler. He tagged Rory. Yep. He tagged him with an uppercut as well. Oh! Knocks him down with a combination. I don't think he necessarily saw the passion, the aggression, the fire in his eyes. The winner by split decision, Ruthless Maybe we put Roy McDonald on this pedestal too early. Maybe it wasn't time for us to talk about him as a championship contender. Just one month after that fight at UFC 167, George St. Pierre vacated his title, and it was announced that Robbie Lawler would have a chance to compete for the belt. Rory McDonald had let a golden opportunity slip through his fingers. Seeing Lawler get the title shot, it goes through your mind, you know, what if, and thinking I could have been there, you know, all these little things are there, but I think this is meant to be, I was meant to lose that fight. At that time, my training, my motivation for being champion, having that killer instinct, seemed faded. I was getting pulled away from what I actually loved about the sport, which I've found myself focusing on now. That performance and that loss really put a fire under me and reminded me of the spark. I need to be champion. Demi Amaya is one of the world's best at jujitsu. Utterly terrifying when he gets you to the ground. It's only just a matter of time before he would submit you. He's got it. It's deep. This is a wrap, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Oh, my goodness. This may be the end. Look at that. Bam. That's it. He is out. He is out. It's all over. Plain and simple, he is one of the best submission experts on the planet. Damian Maya wins. Anyone who scratches their head at grappling or says they're not into MMA because of uh, those aspects needs to watch a Damian Maya fight. Take him down. Very dangerous off his back. Oh, Maya thus far. McDonald right now is in deep, deep trouble. Oh, good. Damian Maya. Unbelievable. When Damian Maya made his UFC debut, he fought at middleweight. We saw him rocket his way up the standings. He got up to be the number one contender 
fought Anderson Silva a few years ago. Obviously didn't go the way that he wanted it to, but then again, not many guys had it go the way they wanted to against Anderson Silva. And still, the UFC middleweight champion of the world. Jimmy Maya ultimately elected to drop to 170 pounds. I think he felt his body was a little more well-suited for welterweight, and the results have shown. After I fight against Anderson Silva, his white man, and some guys like Mark Munoz, I was much smaller than the guys. Some heavy leather thrown by Munoz. Everybody's taller, everybody's stronger, so if I would drop to the welterweight, I would have more advantage. Walter Wade is my natural weight class. So at 170 pounds, I think Damian Maikona went back to his roots a little bit. He kind of returned to the submission grappling game and brought in a little bit of aggression and a little bit more strength at 170 pounds. First time at 170 for the man who won nine times at 185. 170 is his proper weight. He looks healthier. He looks more defined. He looks quicker. This is not good for Dong Young Tim. Incredibly difficult to take this young man down, but Damian Maya does it and mounts him. And that is it. Damian's got the fear in the He's going to switch it off to Paul and just clutch his chin. Finish it here. Damian Maya does it. What a sensational. Damian Maya's third fight at 170 was against John Fitch, who, of course, people for years were saying, this guy deserves another title fight. He's the second best guy in the world. We knew that if we wanted to fight for the title, we need to pass to a test like that. There's the shot. He's got the signal. He's got him down. Drags him down. He's got him down again. Now he's going palm to palm. What we are seeing is dominance in the control position of Damian Maya makes it not even a close fight. That was really the moment that people saw Damian Maya was really this good at 170. Damian Maya reels off three straight wins, has people thinking that he might be a title contender again at 170 pounds, until he runs into Jake Shields. It didn't go the way he wanted on the judges' scorecard, but it was a close split decision. Six months ago, we were looking at Roy McDonald and Damian Maya as potential title contenders. They're both coming off losses in this fight. That's the big thing. These are two guys that have a lot to prove. They are both still contenders, and the winner of this fight puts himself in a really, really nice position, maybe to face the winner of that Johnny Hendricks Robbie Lawler fight. Everything depends on my next fight and depends on my performance in the next fight. The day I will be fighting Rory, for me, in my mind, is like the last day of my life. I plan on destroying him when I walk in there that night. I don't really care about his jiu-jitsu pedigree. This is a fight. I'm here to knock his head off. The performance I'm capable of, I'll have the title shot. With the longtime champion sidelined, the door is open for top welterweights to stake their claim for gold. Former training partners have a score to settle. The undefeated newcomer will debut on short notice and attempt to make a statement. Questions about the much anticipated weight cut will be answered. And the reigning champ will put her belt on the line for the second time in eight weeks. Undefeated Olympic medalists will clash in a true test of wills. UFC 170.